What's going on, everybody? What's up, folks? We are back. Episode 124 of the Dark Windows podcast. It's unfortunate that this is our first episode with our new equipment because we both sound like shit because we're both fucking sick. But you hear that, though? There's no buzz from the board, so that's a plus. Anyway. We're going to call this episode sick. Yeah. (laughs) Episode 124. We are... uh, Speaking of being sick, this this is going to kind of fit right into that but um this week we're talking about franklin's lost expedition where they were trying to find the northwest passage trying to find um a safe route from europe up over the top of the world and back down into asia since the dawn of humanity we as a species have been curious about our surroundings and the boundaries of our planet from not wanting to stray from the caves because there are monsters outside in the beginning to not wanting to sail too far because you might actually go right off the edge of the earth. To our more modern exploration of the deep, dark forests of the Amazon and Congo, and eventually leaving our earthly bonds altogether and going into space. There are many tales through history of unknown and unexplored places and how you would find them. For the better part of three centuries, people searched for an access route from Europe to Asia that would become known as the Northwest Passage. Before we get too far, I think it's kind of important that we go into some history of sea travel, um, just to kind of show how far we've come as a species being able to move across water. The first, quote, seaworthy boats weren't even created by humans, but Homo erectus, which was an ancient ancestor of all of us, that wasn't much more than a naked ape that created tools with cutting edges um, and may or may not have been able to control and create fire. They're not real sure on that part yet. Well, technically they are human, but eh, they're just not modern human. They're not Homo sapien, right? But I mean, you know, fire and tools—that's really not that big of a deal. None of that shit ever has ever come in handy. They originated in Africa and somewhere around eight hundred thousand years ago spread to Asia. Since they couldn't fly, they had to find another way, and they created what most historians think were crude rafts of thick reeds and branches tied together with vines or something of that nature. That's fairly impressive for a species that didn't have the uh, the genes for speech or language at all. Well, as far as we know. Well, just based on what they found with their bone structure, they don't think that they had the, the correct um, throat muscles or bones in the throat to actually create words other than maybe just making noise at each other. Well, you know, until, what, <clears throat> within the past hundred years, we have realized that... Uh... Homo sapien is actually a lot older than uh, once thought. For sure. Dates back to uh, Homo erecticus. Uh, let's see. Astro- it dates back way back. Right. So, I mean, they <clears throat> Homo sapien is being pushed back further and further as far as when it was around. They basically, as the, still in the line from uh, Braveheart, if you can't get them out, breed them out. Yep. Well, that's what they did. Well, that and they just fucking killed a bunch of them, too. True. Um, which a lot of people, a lot of like experts think is where that whole um, idea of the uncanny valley, where things that look too human make us uncomfortable, comes from, is from having other species that were around as this, at the same time as us that looked a little bit too much like us, so we had to get rid of them. So if you've, if you've ever seen any of the rafts that are used in some of the areas of Southeast Asia um, by some of the still mostly uncount, uncontacted tribes... They seem to be fairly similar, like uh, fell logs uh, or bamboo shoots lashed together and propelled by either an oar or just some kind of a big wide stick. Um, So it's a fairly common looking boat that is still around to this day. Now, fast forward a few hundred thousand years to the age of some of the best built wooden ships for exploring of all time, the Viking longships and all of their variants. Most will think Viking longships had dragon heads on the bow and they... They really weren't always like that. Uh, the longship is just the most well-known and honestly the most feared of the boats that they created because those are the ones that, you know, everybody in Europe saw and they're like, oh, fuck, who are these monsters coming out of the ocean? Yeah, it was, that's what those were. 
So they measured anywhere between 45 and 75 feet stem to stern and carried upwards of 100 heavily armed and armored Norsemen. A few super cool facts that I kind of found with those. Um, they were classified by how many oarsmen they had. The Carvey had 13 rowing benches, whereas the Boos had 34 rowing benches. And the term Boos is where the modern word, the modern day word for bus comes from. They could also traverse the deepest parts of the uh, of the ocean, and they could move seamlessly in water that was less than a meter deep. Because they're so shallow. Exactly. No wonder they could fuck up folks so easily. If there's water and Vikings could get there and people had gold, they were going to have gold. Uh, they've, they've actually found these from uh, as far from Scandinavia as Newfoundland and potentially one in Minnesota, but they're not 100% sure if that was real or if that's a hoax. The next huge step would come... Um, sorry, the next huge step in shipbuilding would come in the 15th to 19th centuries where the galleon, frigate, clipper, and other similar class of ships would be built. If you've watched any kind of pirate movie or documentary or anything like that, I'm pretty sure you've seen all of these different ship types. Uh, big, tall, wide, multiple sails, generally heavily armed with cannons. Uh, they, they owned the oceans for a very long time, and the last wooden warships being used were actually in 1917 to chase German subs. And I'm not even kidding about that. Because there was something about how wood didn't really show up that well on the primitive kind of sonar that the, the German subs would have had. They couldn't really classify the difference between a wood boat or driftwood or waves or something like that. It just it, They didn't have the technology to be able to um, tell the difference between them. Well, it was early days of sonar, so yeah. Exactly. Now, with that out of the way, let's kind of get into the exploration of the North, uh, Northwest Passage. This was a passage that for a very long time was just a rumor and tall tale from the seas. There were a few different ways that it was... There were a few different ways it was said you could go to pass from Europe over the top of the world and down to Asia. You could take the Northwest Passage, which would lead between Iceland and the Faroe Islands over toward the top point of Norway and right down along the Russian border through a chain of small, uh, small but seemingly easily accessible, uh, passable islands and down towards China, Japan, and, and your, uh, Asia, like that. Yeah. Or the Northwest Passage, which ran between Greenland and the coast of Newfoundland in the Labrador Sea and north past Nunavut and uh, Baffin Bay and through a series of, of uh, islands of Nunavut. Some of which were really close together, which would make any kind of sane person nervous about sailing through. From there, you'd, you would journey out past Alaska and through the Aleutian Islands and onward down into Asia. Oh, and the other part I forgot to mention is it's frozen pretty much consistently throughout the year to some effect. Whether it's heavily frozen where it's inaccessible or it's like just crispy over the top. There's still ice there, and you still have to try to sail through it. Now, the idea of a passage going west from Europe to Asia goes back a long, long time. Second century AD maps from Ptolemy, a Greek geographer, made some maps showing what he thought would be a viable option. The search really kind of kicked off when the Ottoman Empire was blocking up all the trade routes from Europe to Asia. And those guys were kind of dicks, so you couldn't just be like, hey, can we just like sneak through and maybe go get some silk or something? Oh, no? Okay, cool. We'll just find another way to do it. The first documented voyage into the Northwest Passage was John Cabot, who was a Venetian sailing under the English flag in 1497, when he stumbled into the Canadian Maritime Islands and all of the southern parts of the Northwest Passage. He and his 18-man crew made landfall, on one of the islands, thinking he had made it to Asia, much like Columbus had four years before, except Cabot didn't immediately start killing the natives. He uh, he returned back to England, uh, told Henry the uh, the seventh what they found, and he actually funded another expedition with five ships this time and two hundred men. Um, they actually never made it even back to where the Northwest Passage would be found. Because all five ships and all 200 men were lost at sea during a huge storm in the North Atlantic, somewhere near uh, Greenland. 
the other notable expedition before we get into the big one was in 1610 when the Dutch East India Company sent a crew captained by Henry Hudson to sail north from the Hudson River in search of the fabled Northwest Northwest Passage. He unfortunately led them into the bay that would eventually be named after him, where they floated around and after a month or so got stuck in the ice. After the ship was free of the ice, the crew mutinied and tossed Hudson's ass and all of his followers onto a series of small boats and just kind of shipped them off into the ice and fucked off back to England. Hudson and his loyals were never seen again, obviously, because I'm assuming they fucking froze to death somewhere on some chunk of goddamn ice in the middle of nowhere. So let's get into the reason that we're actually talking about this this week. We're going to talk about uh, John Franklin, who is probably one of the most famous people to have ever sailed into the Northwest Passage, trying to find his way into Asia. John Franklin was born April 16th, 1786 in Spilsby, Lincolnshire, England. And at the age of 14, he joined the Royal Navy and would be part of the crew captained by Matthew Flinders on an expeditionary trip to Australia and Tasmania. At the age of 19, he would take part in the Battle of Trafalgar uh, in 1805, where the British Navy uh, would kind of square off with the French and Spanish as part of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, Ten years later, he would take place in the Battle of New Orleans, which took place after the War of 1812 had actually ended. And that was one where the British were, st- were trying to come back up through New Orleans and try to, like, force their way back north. And the Americans are like, nah, fuck you. You guys can go back to the ocean. Take two of these. Call me in the morning. Have a good one. <coughs> what was that one? Uh, the, the Battle of New Orleans. Oh. In 1818, he earned his first command when Battle he... 1811. What's that? Battle 1811 or 1812. Or 1812, yeah. But yeah. it was actually after 1812. Yeah, actually, because, well, it stopped after because they uh, um, they actually had stopped fighting, but no one actually knew right. that they had stopped. So it was like, uh, shit. Damn. I, I guess we're going to go home now. Yeah. Have a good one, guys. Well, we, we, we our countries had stopped fighting each other. Um, Nobody told us. Okay. Well, it's like uh, every once in a while, like back in the 90s, you'd hear about some fucking Japanese soldier coming out of the woods somewhere in his, you know, uniform with a rifle still, and they're like, what the fuck are you doing? He goes, you know, he's like, we're not still fighting the Americans? No? Oh. I've been out in the woods for 60 fucking years with a gun, waiting. So in 1818, he earned his first command uh, when he led an expedition uh, in search of the North Pole. Uh, This came to an end within the year, uh, and in 1819, he would lead a a three-and-a-half-year trek overland from hudson bay to the arctic ocean to survey the coastline of the copper mine river which uh is in nunavut well it's it's in what's now referred to as nunavut this trip would again this trip would take them into southern nunavut and the northwest territories upon returning from this venture to england he would pen narrative of a journey to the shores of the polar sea in the years 18 19 20 21 and 22 which was published in 1823. I am so glad book titles are not as long-winded as they used to be. Oh, yeah. Because holy crap. Like, they they are... Very descriptive. Yeah. Very long. So, like, you could look at the the title of this and go, okay, I know exactly what this book's about. Perfect. Thumbs up. Well, I mean, that's kind of what they wanted, sort of. They didn't want you to have any, you know, intrigue about it. Yeah. He, he led a second from the mouth of the Mackenzie River to the Northwest Territories and the Yukon, uh, west to Point Beachy, which is now in Alaska. This would add nearly 1,200 miles of mapped coastline to the northwest rim of the North American coastline. After this trip, he returned to England in 1828 and was knighted in 1829. Now, Sir John Franklin became the governor of Tasmania from 1836 to 1843. Um... <clears throat> His stint as governor wasn't super successful. He was kind of uh, ineffective, ineffectual, like aloof, didn't really care about the title, didn't want to do anything. He wanted to get back in a boat. Yeah, his attention was elsewhere. Right. He, he wasn't one of these guys where he, like, he probably got 
super bored just sitting around in the governor's mansion mm-hmm. and not freezing his balls off, hiking and sailing through Canada and the Arctic Circle. So in 1845, he returned to England after giving up um, his seat as governor, and he was ready to once again sail to the great frozen north. He would set sail May 19th, 1845, from England with a crew of 128 men, including officers, on two ships, the HMS Erebus and the HMS Terror. And I think right here would probably be the best place to take our quick break, and we'll come back and finish this thing off. Okay, we're back. The last either of these ships would be seen with whole live crews would be July 1847, when they were spotted by British whaling ships north of uh, north of the Baffin Islands at the entrance of Lancaster Sound. The Erebus was a Hecla-class bomb vessel, whereas the Terror was a Vesuvius-class bomb vessel. Another fun fact, the HMS Terror was actually one of the ships that bombarded Fort McHenry during the Battle of Baltimore. Hmm. You know, anybody that might have been kind of important that would become super famous afterwards that was in that fort? I, I don't know. I, I, I'm... Let me think. Bombs bursting in air. Yeah. Uh, uh, name Francis Scott Key ringing a bell. Oh, that's the yeah. guy. Yep, yep, yep. So he was actually in the in the fort that fateful night, and it's highly possible that some of, like you just said, the bombs bursting in air were fired from the HMS Terror. Now, both ships had been fitted with incredibly reinforced hulls to help push through the ice. Um, They were heavily armored, just in case you ran into any French, American, or Spanish ships out there, because they still would have sunk your ass for it, just for having the wrong flag. But these hulls were something like six feet thick, like super reinforced, because they knew that if they caught a sharp point of ice, even though they're not going super fast, you catch that ice at just the right angle, it's going to pop a hole, and you're going under. So that's why they built them so thick and just kind of bulky. Uh, They would also bring with them all the hand tools they would need for breaking through ice, uh, food provisions to last at least three years, musical instruments, costumes for theatrical plays, in case they got bored. Of course. And a dog and a monkey to keep them entertained. Also, John Franklin brought his bird with him. Which, I mean, a parrot in the cold seems like a really silly idea to me. Well, but, same thing with a monkey. Yeah, yeah. We didn't think about that. Like, oh, it's Harry. Fuck it. It'll be all right. Sure. He'll live. They've got snow bananas there or something. Yeah, yeah, snow bananas. So now's where the story gets a little fuzzy. This is because the ships wouldn't actually be found until 2014, 167 years after they were last seen. (sighs) Yeah. They were frozen that bad, huh? Yeah, they're frozen that bad in an area where fucking nobody goes. Well, they can go there now because there's not a lot of fucking ice. Right. And we also have ships that will slam (laughs) through the ice. Um, Because a lot of, like, the cutter-class ships that the Coast Guard have are, like, they're designed to break through the ice. And the Canadians have a lot of those, too, because, believe it or not, the Canadians have more ice than us. Wow. I mean, they also have polar bears running down the streets, so. That's a possibility. (laughs) Not yet confirmed. So Franklin was at the helm of the uh, of the HMS Erebus, where uh, while well, Francis Crozier headed up the crew of the Terror. Crozier had the most experience of any of the men on either ship when it came to traversing the Arctic, including Franklin. But surprisingly, there was no bad blood. There was no like, "Hey, I should actually be leading this thing." He was just kind of like, "Fuck it, let's let's do it." You know, yeah. he was he was a team player, good guy. I mean, that's what I would think, you know. you got to have somebody that knows a little bit more about something. Right, but if if this guy had been a dick, he could have been like, well, I've got the most experience. Why am I not leading the expedition? Well, you know, because your name's not on the fucking writ. So exactly. There, you, you're, you're not a former governor of a slave colony or yeah. prison colony. Excuse me. Sorry. Yeah, bitch. Take that one. Yeah. So after both ships had passed Queen Elizabeth Island, which is just south of Baffin Island, they would make their way to Beachy Point for the winter. From here, if the crews had just headed west, they would have a pretty, pretty straight shot. I mean, you have to go around a couple of little islands, but nothing huge. And then you're back out to open seas and right down into Asia, Russia, wherever the hell you want to land. 
Uh-huh. But both ships got socked in and trapped in the ice. This was much more of an issue back then during that time period than it is now. Because back then the ships were coal powered and didn't they couldn't generate enough power to break themselves free from the ice. Um whereas today modern ships where some of them are fucking nuclear powered. Yeah. They've got the balls to just be like, eh, whatever, just hit the gas a little bit harder and we'll get out of here. We'll rock well, it back it and forth. It takes a lot more coal because coal, you have to, I mean, it burns hot, but. Right. You know, that temperature, you have to stoke it a lot more. And it probably loses some, like you said, some of its power. Yeah. And what was what I found kind of cool was the, the engines on these ships were, they weren't like traditional coal-powered ships where you just have guys down there just fucking railing coal into the, into the things. They were a corkscrew power. So you had a big hopper full of coal with a corkscrew that would turn and yeah. feed the coal in. And those corkscrews were actually retractable so you could take them out to clean them. But so they would just kind of keep feeding coal in. And then you would have guys just feeding the hoppers instead of like right into the ovens, huh. which makes it so you don't have to have as much of a crew, makes it a little bit easier for everybody because nobody really wants to stand down there and, you know, sweat their dick off and then go up, up topside and fucking freeze. True. So I did actually find a couple of uh, some snippets from Franklin's diary that were uh, that were found when uh, the remains of the Erebus and Terror were found in 2014. And th- so this is coming directly from John Franklin's diary. April 30th, 1847. Ships lie groaning and straining in the ice uh, in the ice off King William Island. On a whim, I brought out my maps of Arctic Canada only to discover that the Admiralty had provided me with the maps of Polynesia, which was an unfortunate error. Jesus yeah. I mean, that's not even like they're next to each other in a drawer somewhere. <laughs> You're just a little bit off. Don't worry about it. So, obviously, there was a, a clerical error, like you just said, because it's not even fucking close. Well, yeah, because, I mean, you had, uh, who was it, uh, Cook, that went, that was already had gone to the Polynesian Islands mm-hmm. back in eighteen whatever. Yeah. So I mean, they are just like, eh. This will be fine. Polynesia, Canada, same difference. Maybe it was mismarked. Either Look that, or they're them. like, hey, between these two guys, they know where they're going. We'll just give them the maps for the where that for you know what they're gonna need. Or they grabbed it by accident. They were like reaching in you know haste or like, uh, ooh, that one. Yeah. You got, like, a phone in each here, like, uh, mm, uh, yeah, this one's fine. Throw it in. Fuck it. Yeah. May 2nd, 1847. Sore gums and loose teeth indicate that many of the crew have scurvy. So I spoke out against the nefarious French mm. disease and initiated tango lessons, and likewise bench pressing of the ship's spittoons to ward it off. First of all, you need vitamin C to get rid of scurvy. You can blame the French all you want, and believe me, it was probably the French's fault, but vitamin C. You don't need to dance. You don't need to bench press spittoons, which sounds fucking terrible. You can dance like, if you want to. You can leave your friends behind. And if those friends are French, and your friends are also French, and they're no friends of mine. Exactly. <laughs> May 3rd, 1847. Ships still murred in the ice. The bosun, in the midst of a tango maneuver, fell overboard, went through the ice, and was promptly torn to shreds by a school of man-eating isobars. Bloody Arctic. I have no idea what the fucking isobar is. It's it's one of those things. Hold on. I'm going to look it up because I don't know. Okay, so they were either torn apart by a line on a map connecting points having the same atmospheric pressure at the given time or on average over a given period, <laughs> or two or more isotopes of different <laughs> elements which the sa- with the same atomic weight. I don't think so. I'm going to guess they probably got eaten by seals. I don't know. Probably. May 5th, 1847. Dreamt Lady Jane, who was his wife, came for a visit and asked, Sir John, why are you late to supper? I'm looking for... goddamn business, woman. (laughs) Shut up, bitch. (laughs) Back to the kitchen with thee. All right, maybe he didn't say that. I'm looking for the Northwest Passage, dear, I told her. But you can't eat the Northwest Passage, can you? She replied ominously and then vanished. Yes, right before I, I could punch her for getting out of fucking line. <laughs> I can too, reach it, she said. I'll fucking eat whatever I want. You shut up. So he's having hallucinations. Oh, it was just a dream. The okay. hallucinations haven't started yet, I don't think. May 8th, 1847. Lost three men today. One to scurvy, another to terminal gingivitis, 
which sounds fucking terrible. You died of bad breath and gum disease. That's what happens, man. And yet another to Anui. No fucking clue there. To make matters worse, the steward told me in his inadmittable fashion, we ain't got no more elvenness for you, sir. How can I captain the expedition without my elvenness? Says, hold on. Uh, why the fuck did the British use such stupid fucking words? There's a reason that when they came here and we kicked their asses out, we knocked a bunch of fucking letters out of words because it was fucking stupid. Okay. So, so you got no more fucking tea bags. Okay. Oh my God. That, that could actually be a tragedy for the British. Well, that's that's the national emergency right. for them. I'm pretty sure they would. They've declared war over running out of tea before. I mean, at that time, well, it cl- wow, it's supposed bu- to be enough for us too. A, a bunch of fucking drunk Americans dressed like Indians went into a ship, were like, "Fuck your tea, motherfucker!" Right into the fucking bay. We were being just, you know, we were being uh, childish, but it was fun. If I could go back in time, I would totally help him fucking pitch tea over the edge of boats and be like, fuck these clowns. Take a hike. I'd also bring an AR-15 back and be like, yo, I'm going to help you guys out a lot. <laughs> but if you brought an AR-15 back, holy shit. For sure. I mean, you would have killed everybody. George, buddy, this thing here is a motherfucker. <laughs> Pardon my language. You're going to like this. It's going to fuck all the mothers. I brought you one, and I brought me one. You want those islands back? I mean, that that's, that that country back? We will get it back for you. Listen, you let me you let me climb back in my box. I'll come back with some more stuff, and we'll go over there, and we'll fuck with them instead. Really? Mm-hmm. We Goddamn will, right. We will fuck on them. Yeah, we will fuck inside the British. <laughs> yes. That was gross. <laughs> May 11th, 1847. The cook, extremely upset over our empty lo- uh, larders says there isn't even there isn't enough solder there isn't enough solder left inside of our food tins hang in there old chap i told him but the roar of the wind in the ship's rigging garbled my words and he tried to hang himself at least the men are still obeying my orders so this dude thinks that the captain just told him to hang himself because the wind caught him just right and he's like yes sir right away sir up the rigging i go <laughs> uh, in there, chap. I mean, go hang yourself. Yeah, but the, but the fact that he's like, hey, at least they're still listening to the, you know, they're still doing what I'm telling them to do. <laughs> That's fucking silly. Uh, May twelfth, eighteen forty seven. Dense fog. We can't even sh- see the ship's prow, much less possible shortcut to the Orient. May Why 4- is everybody still trying to get to the goddamn Orient? Because you need. Jesus. Spices? And... No, you don't. MSG? Did they have MSG back then? Probably did. I oh, man. Oh. I wasn't around, okay? May 14th, and I swear to God, this one should be all in... I bet this one is all in caps. We are totally out of crumpets. Ooh. So I had to feed Cedric... Cedric was Franklin's pet toucan. A few forlorn scraps of hardtack. Not surprisingly, he squawked in protest. I would, too. I'm telling you, that first sentence, if you could actually read it, I guarantee it is in all capitals. Probably. Because right there is like, motherfucker. It's the end of the world. Yes. We're out of fucking tea. Now the crumpets are gone. What's next? The biscuits? The digestibles? Mm-hmm. <sighs> We're fucked. Sorry, but that's just the way it is. We ran out of spotted dick three months ago. Except for Percy, his dick spotted, but he's got fucking well, that's you know, different. Whatever it is, that's penis virus, something like that. May fifteenth, eighteen forty-seven. Took bearings and discovered that instead of of corpulent, I am now merely portly. Remar- remarkable that I can now ascend the masthead as well as descend from it. Well, you're not so, so fat. Yeah, he lost a lot of weight because he's not eating. <laughs> May seventeenth, eighteen forty-seven. Men shivering almost constantly. Their beards are hung with icicles as the Admiralty somehow has seen fit to supply us with tuxedos and cummerbunds rather than parkas. Wrote a letter to pro- wrote a letter of protest to the First Lord. Then such was my hunger that I proceeded to eat it. 
I mean, at least you're going to die looking good, right? Exactly. This is the, like, okay, so this is the same shit that, um, I don't know, 50-ish years ago, Napoleon did, where he's like, hey, I'm going to go to Russia, but pack your windbreakers. It's not going to be that cold, which is now why Russians like tracksuits. This was grandfather's jacket. He killed Napoleon in it. Don't he worry. kills six Frenchmen, take their jackets, turn it into one. Now he squat and smoke cigarettes and drink vodka. Anyway, May 27th, 1847, several savages, in parentheses, Eskimos, visited, peoples. visited the ship today. They brought us a batch of pemmican eggs. Alas, all rotten. Must have been laid before the great pemmican migration south. Ah. In, in return, we gave each of the savages a tuxedo and cummerbund. Well, that's awful. Nice right? Song. Here's a fucking a good trade. You know, you give us some rotten eggs, so we're going to give you some shit that we don't want to wear. Exactly. But now there's just some dude freezing his dick off in his igloo, but he looks fucking great. He's a classy mother. That's right. And now everybody else is jealous. Where did you find such a suit? I'm not It's not made you. of the skins of a seal. How are you warm? I'm not, but I look good. March 29th, 1847. More misfortune. One of the crew, doubtless a petty officer, has eaten poor Cedric. They ate his bird. I said to Fitzjames, who was Franklin's second in, in command, find the bounder respond, uh, responsible for this and give me a taste of the cat. Sorry, sir, Fitzjames told him, but we've already eaten the ship's cat. Like, if this wasn't under such dire, like, bullshit, this would be really funny. I mean, we're fucking gross. So that's why we're laughing at it anyway. Well, Yes. I mean, I want to know how the cat tasted, really. I mean, honest. it would have tasted better if they got into Asia and got some spices on that shit. Probably. You can't just fucking flake ice over it and be like, oh, look, I seasoned it. Well, that's what happens when you stay in place for too long. Yeah. May 30, May 31st. May 31st. May 31st, 1847. Uh, 1847. Lieutenant Ormy, a clean-shaven fellow except for his clump of grizzled whiskers, broke into my cabin and consumed the contents of my chamber pot. Then began singing "Rule Britannia." I put in the section. I put him in the section of the sick bay reserved for nutters. Uh, well. He literally just ate your shit and started singing. So yeah, he probably does need to be in the crazy house part of the boat. Uh, I would say so. Yes, yes, yes. I'll go with that. June fifth, eighteen forty-seven. Weary of being mired in ice, we abandoned ship and began making our way to Bax Fish River. Thence. That's a fucking weird one. Thence we hope to England's green and pleasant land. The men came. Uh, the men carried me in a sedan chair. Two days into our journey, I realized I'd forgotten my robe and slippers, so we marched back to the ship. <sighs> Whatever. Okay, so you see where this is going, right? I want him to die now. Because, like... <sighs> I was hoping for a happy ending, but now I just want him dead. I'm assuming the British now, like the few that I know, are not nearly as pompous as these guys are. But, like, you know, I forgot my, my robe and slippers. We clearly can't go any further than this. Return. We're fucking fucked. kidding. The mission's doomed. Yeah. We're all go gonna, back. We're all going to die. I don't have my robe and slippers. What the fuck? June 8th, 1847. Abandoned the ship a second time. Curiously, my sedan chair seems to have disappeared, and now I'm being manhauled in a sledge filled with towels, kettles, Sailmakers, palms, porcelain cups, bedding, check, uh, checkerboards, our portive organ, uh, our portive organ, uh, Jesus, our portive organ, longboats, etc. So we got all the important shit, like all the cups and the checkerboards and the towels. I mean, the towels could become handy if you had to like bundle up, whatever. June 9th, 1847, met a group of savages and asked them using signs for the route to Bax River, uh, Bax Fishing River. They fled in terror when Fitzjames produced a loud blast of flatulence. Sorry, sir, he said, but starvation seems not to agree with me. So he literally farted these Eskimos away. Let that sink in for a second. <laughs> and they just fucking take off. Well, I mean, I would flee too, but that's... Yeah. What kind of fucking devil magic is this? I mean, I'm assuming that Eskimos would fart, too. It's kind of a natural thing that everybody does. Whatever, though. 
But this probably smelled really bad, maybe. I, I, as long as this wasn't the guy that was eating somebody else's shit. Uh, June 10th, 1847. Longboats abandoned owing to the terrestrial aspect of the land. So the longboats were like um, almost like a, a survival boat uh-huh. that you would have had with it. So they, they grabbed a couple of those to bring with them yep. in case they hit more water. Of course. June 12th, 1847. Dr. Goodsir, our surgeon... Tried, uh, tried to enliven things by asking us which vegetable the Admiralty forbade us taking on board the Erebus. Answer, leeks. Only good, only good sir himself laughed at this feeble joke, and as he did, several of his teeth loosened in his gums and then fell into the snow. <laughs> L. Also, Dr. Good Sir sounds like a totally fucking made-up name. I think it might be, but... June th- if he was even a real person, he may have been hallucinating this guy the entire time. That's that's a strong possibility. June 13th, 1847. What a nuisance. I seem to have left my monogrammed cutlery and all of my medals on the Erebus. So we have no choice but to march back to the ship, which was now a sorry sight. But the fore and aft decks were covered with a thick coat of scurvy. We had to go back to get my fucking monogrammed Forks and knives and shit. Well, you can't leave home without them. Fuck this guy. Fuck this guy. Fuck, fuck, fuck this guy. You're like six days travel. And now you're like, oh, hey, I forgot my other stuff. Well, we got to go back. Sorry, guys, but uh, we have to turn around again. Okay, how somebody didn't cave this motherfucker's head in at this point and just be like, I don't know. He fell. I don't know what happened. A snow leopard got to him. A giant fucking whale came up out of the ocean, smacked his ass. Yeah, uh, fucking some, uh, I don't know, he just, he, he was like that when I left him. He I, was ca- I came back and his head was fucked up. Yeah. Oh, okay. June 14th, 1847. A blizzard has kept us on the ship, so I began working on a talk to be, uh, to be given tomorrow at tea time. Key sentences include, eat your boots, man. They're quite tasty. <laughs> Give me a nice fresh boot over steak and kidney pie any day. So he is nuts now. Yeah. Well, no, he's just, I think now he's just trying to keep his guys from fucking kill, uh, killing him. No, I think he's nuts. Because if you turn back that many times, you're nuts. Yeah. So this is actually his last journal entry. Oh, thank God he's dead. June 15th, 1847. Hello. What's this? Fitz James has barged into my cabin without a knock. Sir John, he says, brandishing his cutlass. The men and I have made an important de- decision. The cabin boy is lean and emaciated. Well, you, and that's where it ends. Ah, they were gonna they they were so... gonna kill the the cabin boy, but you're lean, so we're gonna kill you, and we're gonna eat your ass. Here, the di- uh, the diary necessarily breaks off, but the uh, but the, I mean, reader obviously readers will have no trouble kind of figuring out exactly what possibly happened to Franklin. So, I mean, maybe they killed him or maybe he just froze to death while he was writing it, but I'm going to lean a little bit closer to, since this dude came in like a vast fucking sword brandished and shit. And he's like, Hey, so since you're a piece of shit and you've made us walk back to this fucking ship twice to get your stupid bullshit, we've had enough of it. So we're all out of boots so I guess we're gonna eat you next. You're dead, motherfucker. No. Oh yeah, and you look really tasty. Yeah. Just want to let you know. Rum ham. Sir John Franklin and twenty three others would make the ship their final resting place. After the death of Franklin, the remaining one hundred and five survivors would trek out over the ice back toward the mainland again. They started again for Back River, knowing that it would put them only a few days' walk from Hudson Bay, where they would have a better chance of being rescued. The only problem they were having is they were still on foot, trekking across the ice and frozen plains a few hundred miles from anywhere that they'd be uh, could be considered a viable uh, rescue point. The only thing that I can say is, from looking at a map from where the ship was found, if these guys had just headed east and stayed on the island they were on, they would have come right out to the edge of this island, which would have put them, I shit you not, almost exactly where 
the whaling ships had last seen the sh- last seen the Erebus and Terror. If they had just stayed on the island and just gone east, it would have put them almost exactly where they were last seen, which would have meant there would probably be a very good chance of them being rescued. Well, see, that is what hindsight gets you. Right. Also, when you have the um, unfair advantage of Google Maps at your disposal, and you can just be like, oh, hey, they should have just done this. So I kind of armchair quarterbacked it there. But again, you know, I wasn't up there eating birds and probably monkeys and dogs. And then, you know. Talking to things. Yeah. That, that didn't talking to the boat. Well, the boat doesn't talk back. And then you get mad at the boat because it doesn't talk back. <laughs> and then you eat your captain. Yeah. So now out in the frozen wasteland of northern Canada, they start dropping like flies due to exposure. With the capillaries constricting to force blood back to vital organs, your extremities would get very, very cold. Your nervous system drives your heart rate, blood pressure, and respiratory system way higher than it should be. With, a, a, with blood being forced back to your organs, you'd also start to lose color and be, uh, in the beginning of the beginning stages of frostbite would start setting in. You begin having a hard time moving due to your muscles being so cold that they can't really function. You become mentally foggy due to the enzymes in your brain becoming less efficient, which, as you're listening to this episode, you'll understand that's exactly what's going on with both of us. Our brain enzymes are fucked up. But my, my brain is in a fucking haze. My brain was on fire for the last two days, and it's gone now, thankfully. Now I just can't breathe. Your fingers and toes start to turn blue and then black, which you wouldn't even notice this stage unless you actually looked at them because you're so cold that you don't realize your shit's freezing and changing color well first off hope my shit isn't changing color well i don't know if you'd even be shitting at this point you might be now that hypothermia has thoroughly set in your heart rate and respiratory rate start to decrease this can cause hallucinations which we've already seen Uh uh-huh which this is due to the oxygen rate in your brain dropping you may start stripping off your clothes in a strange phenomena called paradoxical undressing. Um, some scientists think that this has to do with the sudden dilation of blood vessels that can cause a feeling of uh, of sudden, like very like sudden hotness to the point where it almost feels like you're on fire. So you strip your clothes off, uh-huh. try to cool down. Um, this could also potentially lead to another phenomena that is called terminal burrowing where you try to get as small as you can in a small enclosed space like an animal trying to hibernate. You'll eventually lose consciousness, and your organs will shut down, and you'll die. Oh, nice. Now, if you're a member of the 105 survivors that left the ship, dying may not have been the end of things for you. Because sometimes after you die, you have to be digested by another human being because when everybody's dying and everybody's starving... There's this neat thing called cannibalism. Uh. Yeah. So a lot of the, uh, they said that a lot of the skeletons that they found near the ship showed signs of cannibalism, including knife and teeth marks and bones. Very nice. And they, they kind of matched it up because obviously there are animals that will eat bones like uh, squirrels, chipmunks, porcupines, skunks, all that shit. A lot of these matched up to human teeth marks in the bones. Yeah, um, I mean, there's no porcupines or right. all that up there. Hope I, mean, I don't think. I, I have no fucking clue. I mean, there could be. I have no idea. Um, so the crew took samples of the remar- some of the more remarkably well-preserved bodies, which I have pictures of and I will be putting up on Facebook, um, that were found in the ice. Uh, and they found that some of them had contracted botulism, scurvy, and lead poisoning. Oh, and they think that some of them, um, they think that some could have been caused by the canned food that they brought, where due to the canning process still being fairly new at the time, uh-huh. it may not have been sealed correctly. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And this could have, uh, this could have caused like any kind of bacterial or fungal infections to grow in the food, and they don't even realize it, and they're eating it, and they're getting themselves sick. Which could lead to the. The whole delirium and everything. Probably. Exactly, for sure. In 2008, an assortment of Canadian government, private, and nonprofit agencies launched a mission to uncover additional archaeological evidence of the Franklin Expedition. That search bore fruit in September 2014 when a remotely operated submersible 
uh, obtained sonar images of a wreck that was later identified as the Erebus on the ocean floor just off King Williams Island. Two years later, the wreck of the Terror was found in Terror Bay, approximately 60 miles north of the Erebus site. The ship was was remarkably well-preserved. Researchers explored the wreck with a remote-operated submarine and observed that the Terror's hull remained intact. So the only reason that it would have sunk would have been when the ice broke up and then started moving, and it would have rolled the ship and sunk it that way. So it didn't pop a hole in anything. Um, In addition, most of its hatches on the ship had been battened down, suggesting that the crew had prepared the ship for winter before departing. So obviously they knew they were getting ready to winter, you know, we're going to stay here. We're just batting down the hatches. We'll stay in, keep everything warm. Yeah. And it didn't work out so hot, but that's, uh, that's Franklin's lost expedition. I've wanted to talk about this one for a while. And, uh, the, the, the fucking diary entries, man, they made it even better because I honestly had no idea I was going to find any of that. And then I didn't, I was like, Oh, this is good. And I'm reading it. And I'm like, this is fucking silly. This guy is out of his goddamn mind. He may have been crazy before he got on the boat. Uh, that's a possibility. Because, I mean... Too much time on an island. We'll do that to you, I guess. I have no fucking clue. It's it's just... The the second time we had to turn around to go back and get this dude's fucking... Like, as soon as he's like, hey, I forgot my robe and stuff. We got to go back. And I'm like, no. Captain or not, no. Sorry. Yeah. I'm not going to freeze my fucking balls off to go get your goddamn coat slippers and pipe get the fuck out of here do you want us to bring the fireplace with us too so you can sit in front of it comfortably me lord fuck off you douchebag you say one more time you need to turn back but but we're gonna kill you but my cutlery fuck your cutlery i don't care (sighs) oh my god it's just yeah so what'd you think of that one yeah kind of cool that was fun um, i was waiting for him to die yeah it i think everybody enough. was it took realistically enough, where they're just like enough. fuck this guy what a piece of shit pompous douche um yeah so that's uh that's what we got for franklin's lost expedition sweet um sorry if we don't sound you know like we usually do we don't go on like we usually do but uh again we're both sick you can probably tell yeah. I, i'm still waiting on my results whether i have the flu or space aids um, I'm assuming the flu, since I don't think space aids is a real thing. But no, you better not have the space aids. You just been licking doorknobs. That's why you got sick. No. Uh, no. A- anyway, Kevin, why don't you talk about some headphones? Yeah. So you want a pair of headphones, earbuds, uh, Bluetooth speaker, anything else like that? Go over to studio.com. Yes. Check them out. <clears throat> and if you want to order, have your order by Christmas, uh, they are telling you to order by the 15th to receive it be- before Christmas. Um, and I think they offer gift wrapping too. Yeah, they, they do. I know like saves you a couple my, of minutes. Mine came in with like a little fancy. I got a new pair of Clars. What? Yeah, I know I'm stepping up my game Yeah, it, and uh, they came with a ba- uh, gift bag. I don't know if the, the Clars are fit in the bag, but it might be close. If not, you got a, you got a bag though. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, go check them out. And uh, when you find what you want, I know you will, put the promo code of uh, DarkWindows15 in where it says coupon to get 15% off your entire purchase. And uh, you can also go over to DarkWindowsPod.com. Uh, you can check out all of our stuff there. You can listen to every episode of this happy horseshit we've ever recorded. Uh, through links to our Age of Radio page. And while you're over there, you can find some other excellent shows like our buddy Justin at Mysterious Circumstances and the lovely ladies at Color Me Dead, Angel and Nikki. And there's pretty much everything. There's something for everybody. I can't talk. My entire body hurts and I hate myself. Um, But you can also find our studio link there where you can uh, go get yourself some of them headphones. Oh, yeah. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much uh, that's it. I don't want to do this sick again. I hate this shit. Being no. sick, not the show. I only partially dislike the show. I hate being sick, though. Only partially dislike the show. Yes. So oh. anyway, with that being said, 
just because you can't see out into the dark doesn't mean that the dark can't see into you. I hate being sick. Me too. I'm going to die, I think. Goodbye.